All right, guys. Um, again, my name is Eric Kurtz. Um, from North Canton City Schools, and this session is on Gmail safety and security for schools. I uh, want to make sure you're aware that everything I'm sharing is all available online. So when you walked in, you probably got a, a piece of paper. If not, you can grab one on the way out by the, by the door there, and it references this tiny URL address uh, that has all the resources for this session. So if you go to tinyurl.com slash Kurtz26, or if you scan the QR code here on the sheet, that's going to take you to, I'm going to pop it up here for you, that will take you over to this site here. Um, and everything that we're going to be talking about is going to show up on this site as well. This is the Apps User Group site, and I'll mention a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but the handout for the session is here. Um, our sample objectionable word list, so if you want a nice list of dirty words, there they are. We'll talk about that. Um, we've got our student Gmail guidelines, our st student Gmail safety measures, uh, sample student acceptable use policy. So all of that stuff is on the site there um, that I'll be referring to today. So hopefully that will assist you if you need to get to that content later on. Go ahead and pull our presentation back up. And there's definitely seats. If you guys want to come up and get a seat, please feel free to. Um, all right, and I am joined today by John Fano. John works with me at North Canton City Schools. John is our network administrator, and uh, together we manage Google Apps for our district. Uh, let me go ahead and get started here with a little introduction. Like I said, I'm from North Canton. I've uh, been there 21 years. I uh, started off as a math teacher and then moved over to technology and been doing technology there for the last 14 um, I'm a husband and a father of four from kindergarten to college and an all-around geek. Uh, I am a Google Apps certified, oh hey, no we don't want to change that, there we go. I'm a Google Apps certified trainer and a Google certified teacher as well. Um, I do run a website called Apps User Group, that's the one that you saw me referencing there just a moment ago. I'll go ahead and pull that back up so you can see. Apps User Group, that's where I've got all the handouts and everything from the session. Uh, apps User Group is a website that if you're in any way involved in Google Apps in your district, either you're a Google Apps district now or you're looking to become one, it's a great resource of uh, help guides and tutorials and news. There's a forum with hundreds of people in there. If you've got a question, somebody has an answer to it. There's ways to add your school to the list of all the schools that are using Google Apps. It's just a really nice site. That's appsusergroup.org. Would definitely encourage you to check that out if you're involved with Google Apps. Um, I'm also fortunate to be uh, co host of the State of Tech podcast. Eric Griffith, who's sitting here in the front row, is one of my co hosts as well. And then Sean Beavers is another one, and he's running around here somewhere at the conference. Uh, but you can definitely visit the stateoftech.org. It's a, a bi weekly ish uh, podcast. <laughs> Sometimes more bi-weekly than others, sometimes bi-monthly, <laughs> at least it's not bi-annually yet, uh, where we cover ed tech topics in and around the state of Ohio. Um, and why does that keep coming up? Keep the current, just don't show that. Thank you. Okay. And for everything else, ericurtz.com. All right. So that's who we are. Um, let's go ahead and get going. Our agenda today is really to cover most of these items here related to Gmail safety and security. Uh, I would be curious, though, to make sure that I'm hitting what everybody needs here. Who is already using Gmail in your school district by a show of hands? Wow, pretty much everybody. I, I don't know. Is there anybody who's not yet? You're just kind of looking at this? Okay, just a few then. Okay, so a lot of people are already using Gmail. Excellent. Uh, we've been on Google Apps for three years in our district, um, and this was one of the big, big things. When we went to roll out Google Apps, of all the possible things that could be a stumbling block or a concern or whatever, it was how are you going to handle email for the students? That you know, and understandably so. I mean, that was a concern from the parents, from the from the staff, from you know the administration. Uh, how are you going to take care of that? And so I'll mention, I'll show you a few of the resources we put out. But basically, this is we're going to talk about the the tools that Google provides to allow you to be able to do things like to disable automatic forwarding and to have a bad word list and to block email going out to other domains and to keep certain grade level kids from emailing other grade level kids at a different level. All of those sort of things can be controlled inside of the Google Apps uh, control panel. Now in the past, I don't know if you've been with Gmail for a while, anybody know Postini? Does that ring a bell for anybody? Okay. Postini used to be the service for this. Uh, Google did not have their own service to do these sort of things. And so they had worked with a uh, company that produced Postini 
Message Security was the name of the product. Um, and that's what we used when we first rolled out Google Apps. So we did all the same things inside of Postini. Well, they wanted to bring that in-house. And so they went ahead and they started uh, adding more features to the Google Apps control panel. And eventually they got to a point that they've turned off the Postini option. And now everything is done inside of Google Apps. So that was a transition that a lot of us went through. All right. And again, just to show you, on that, hand, on that page that is linked in the handout, um, I do have, besides the handout for the session, um, which is definitely, definitely check out this handout if, if you haven't. Um, there is a load of stuff in the handout here. Um, everything I'm going to talk about today from naming your users and accessing security settings, disabling forwarding, managing bad word lists. Um, oh my goodness, all kinds of stuff. Content rules. It's a long handout. So all of this information, it's an eight page handout, gets into all the gory details of everything I'm sharing today. So if I talk real fast and if you miss something, either check the video later in the screencast or check the handout. Loads and loads and loads of great material in that handout there. All right. Um, also on here, like I said I do have a link to our objectionable word list. So if I click that, very bad words will come up. Um, and then I've got a link to our Gmail guidelines. This is something that we sent out to our parents when we, our parents and our students, when we are first rolling out Gmail to them, that explains what students are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Okay, kind of goes through all of that. And then we've got one here also, which was safety measures, which was more for the parents, which again, let them know the things we're doing to make sure that they, their students are being safe with their use of Gmail, okay? So all of those handouts are there available for you to use, to reference, to build off of if you want to. And our student AUP is there as well. All right, well, let's go ahead and get into this. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with Google Apps. Uh, to restrict how email uh, works with students, we're going to start off with some before you begin things. Things that maybe uh, might have made things a little easier for us <laughs> if we had realized some of these things early on, but they'll be definitely good for you. Um, and we're going to talk about organizations and naming your users before we do anything else. So let's go ahead and I'm going to pop over to my control panel. So anybody who uses Google Apps, you're familiar with this. You, you know what this is. This is your apps control panel. If you haven't gone Google yet, this is where you're going to go to control all of your settings related to Google Apps. Well, um, in here, before we do anything else, we are going to talk about organizations and users. Because when you go to control email later, it makes a big difference that you have organizations and that you have users named in such a way that you can match them appropriately and apply rules to them, okay? When you create rules and filters and all these sort of things, you're going to apply them to the organizations that the students are in. So if you're not familiar with that concept, basically if you go to organizations, organization and users, you'll see that what you end up getting is sort of a tree structure here. And in our school, we've set up it so that we've got an IT organization, we've got a students organization, a staff organization. Inside of students, we've broken them up into uh, elementary, middle school, and high school. Inside of there, we've got different grade levels. And that's helpful. You want to think through how you set up your organizations, because if you want to apply a rule differently to one group of students than you do to another, they're going to have to be in different organizations for the most part. So the more you kind of think that through ahead of time, the better off you're going to be. Another thing that's really helpful is how you name your students. Now, we did this three years ago and we just went with their student IDs. So for our students, they all have a six or seven digit ID number. And that's fine. It makes them unique, but it does not really have any information other than six or seven digits. I've seen a lot of schools who have been creative and they've put maybe the graduation year in the student username. Now that's not a bad idea because it gives you an extra piece of information if you want to do some sort of rule that says students who are in this grade level, elementary maybe, can't send email to high schoolers and vice versa. 
I can't do that as easily. And I'm going to show you some tricks, if we have time, that yes, there are ways to accomplish that. It can be done. But if you've got them named in such a way that maybe their graduation year is in there, even if it's not actually the year written out, if you use a code for it or something, that's fine too. But that can go a long way to making it easier for you later on to match who's who when you apply the rules. Okay? So do think about that. Think about how you name and think about how you set the organizations. For today, I'm just going to use this testing org. Is that okay, John? I'm not going to break anything, right, if I use the testing org? Okay, good. Um, this testing org just has test students and stuff in there. And you'll see that inside of the testing org, I've got some sub orgs. I've got a sub one and a sub two in there. And you can always create new orgs. You just come up here to click add sub organization. You can make another one underneath there. But I'm going to take test student here with an ID of all zeros. And I'm going to go ahead and move that student. Oops, no, not there. I'm not. There we go. I'm going to move that student into sub one. So I've got that kid in there, excellent. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna move this other student into sub two. And that will give us a chance to play around with them later here and see if we can apply some rules that will keep one student from emailing the other. Okay, so we're gonna put the other student in sub two. All right, there we go. So sub one has my zero, zero, zero student. My other test student is in sub two. All right, so any questions about the Google Apps control panel as far as organizations and users. Yes? We already have organizations set up in Active Directory. That's actually what we, we do. Um, John, do you want to talk about, well, I guess, want to talk anything about our Active Directory sync? Don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> I just did put you on the spot. <laughs> John will answer some of the technical questions. All right. So think about your organizations. Think about your users. Now, let's say you've got your, your students in there. You've got your organizations in there. You, everybody's ready to go. Where do you start controlling the email settings? Well, all of that is going to be over on the settings tab on the far right. So if you go ahead and you look to the far right, you see the settings tab. Give that a click. And then down the side, you're going to see services. Email's about halfway down the side there, so we'll go ahead and click on service or an email under services. And that opens up our email settings. Now again, this used to be in Postini, then they started bringing it over, and there was a piece here and a piece there and a piece here. They've nicely consolidated it all in one area now. So let me give you a quick overview of what this looks like. Basically, guys, what you get here is you get all of your organizations. So there they are. I can see my organizations. And any organization I can click on to expand and see the sub-orgs underneath it. And then when I've chosen an organization, like testing, below there, I can now scroll down, and these are all the settings I can apply to the testing org. Okay, and there's a lot of stuff in there you can do. Now, we don't mess with a lot of it. I mean, some of the stuff just doesn't really apply. But there are several things in there that are very useful to go in and do. Now, keep in mind, whatever you do, it's affecting that organization and anything below it. It cascades down. So if I set something on testing, it's going to apply to all of them. So, for example, let me go up to our students. If I look on our students org, we have a lot of rules in here, such as blocking bad words, blocking to our listservs, blocking to non-domain, blocking from non-domain, all that sort of stuff. But then if I break it down further and go in to our elementary, at the elementary level, then we add in, is it there that I added in? Yes, blocking to the other student accounts. Because in our school district, the way that, the way that it's been set up, and it's gonna be different for every school, I'm sure, is our elementary students have email all the way down to kindergarten. Now, they may not use it, but they have it. But the caveat is they cannot send email to anyone other than the staff members. Okay, that's just the way it's set up. The elementary students can't email other students. They can't email outside the domain. It's just them and their teachers. Okay, that's how the staff felt comfortable with it, so that's how we set it up. 
When you get to the high school and middle school, though, they are able to email other students and the staff, but not outside of the domain. Although if they need to, you might have seen it there while I was expanding those, we do have an organization called Students with External Email that we can move students into when they need to be able to have the ability to send email outside of the domain, which is, for example, uh, John, would you say our um, high school yearbook, uh, is it, or is it a newspaper staff? I'm trying to think which one. Business class. I think the other ones have asked for it too, though. So we've got certain, like our business class, certain groups at the high school, they need to be able to email outside of our domain, and so we can set them up in there. All right, well, let's go back to the testing org, and let's look at the kind of things we can tweak in here. And um, we're just going to basically go down the line here, and I'll show you uh, something really simple to start with. Okay, so the very first one, very first one that I'm going to call your attention to is automatic forwarding. Now, this is one that you probably want to take a look at if you don't want your students to be able to take their school email and send it off to another email account. We do not want them to do that. We want them to keep their email within our system. And so you see here, allow users to automatically forward email to another address. That's one that we go ahead and uncheck for our students so that the email will stay in our domain. Very simple one to do, but anytime you make a change, it kind of highlights in yellow, and then down here you can come to hit save changes to apply that. So that's one that is a useful one to be aware of. All right, let's keep scrolling down. Another one that's a big topic is objectionable content. So if you go down closer to the bottom of the list of options there, you'll see an option to configure content filters based on word lists. I'll show you how that works. So basically, if I come in here and I hit configure, it'll open up this screen where I can set my objectionable content rules. I can apply it to inbound, outbound, meaning of the domain, as well as internal sending and receiving. Okay? And that's true for pretty much all of the filters. And then what you get here is a uh, option to have a custom objectionable word list. And if I click on edit, you'll see that I don't have anything in this one yet. I'm in a testing org. So we've done this for our students, but not here in this testing org. But what I could do is I could come in here and say no words have been added yet. And I could go ahead and add in some objectionable words. Well, for our example today, we'll just put in something like Twilight, because I think that's kind of objectionable. And uh, we'll save that in our testing one there. Um, and that should be, oops, did I get it there? Edit. All right. So that would have my objectionable word there. And then I can say, of course, it could be a word list. You could have as many words in there as you want. I'll show you the other one later. You can have, we've got about 112 words in our objectionable word list that we have there. Um, oops, did I get that in there? Right? Oops. I'm questioning myself. Nope, no, I added it twice. There we go. There, once is enough. All right, then below there, you decide what are you going to do? If somebody includes these objectionable words in there, what should you do based upon that? And there's a lot of options. One is to modify the message or to reject the message. Now, if you say modify the message, that means you're going to pretty much let it go through, but with some conditions. So you can add headers to it. You can stick something on the subject. So you could put some other word, you know, a warning or a highlight or something in the subject there. Um, I could change who it goes to. So instead of going to who it was going to go to, we can say, nope, we're going to replace it with a different email address, and I could send all of those emails to the, you know, the principal's account or the guidance or to a catch-all account that people review at some point. That's certainly fine. I can also strip attachments, or I can add more recipients. So let it get delivered, but also add in the principal or add in the guidance counselor or add in this catch-all account. So you can choose to let it go through, but have these other additional changes to it, or you can simply say, no, we're going to reject that message. Okay? And when you reject the message, you can put in a custom notice to say, 
uh, this message has been rejected because it you know violates our objectionable word list or it violates the student acceptable use policy or something like that that's actually what we do okay if we take it well I'll scroll back up and show you if we take a look at our student rules we just reject it flat out so if there's a word in there that's inappropriate the message just doesn't go through but you definitely do have options there that you could if you wanted to say you know copy it to the guidance counselors or the principal or somebody like that well is there a default list of bad words unfortunately no there's not a default list I mean you you've got a you've got to put your own list in yeah um, now that's why I've got that list for you there if we go back up to our students one whoops let me go ahead and save my changes here if we go back up to my students org and we scroll down to objectionable content you'll see that I'll go ahead and edit that you'll see that there is our word list and so warning PG 13 well okay maybe worse uh, there is there is our objectionable word list. well I'll show you the list elsewhere and basically we reject the message okay now so what it does yes you can just paste it in as, as uh, comma separated values so if you go to again go back to the apps user group site remember when you first came in I talked about this website it is linked on the handout it's also that first link in the presentation there's a uh, tiny URL that gets you right to this web page on here you'll see that we do have a sample objectionable word list and oh, I guess they're just space separated not comma separated sorry uh, you can copy this and paste it straight in and they'll just go right in now as far as where we got this word list from um, <laughs> what I did was I started with George Carlin's list and then I stood in the hallway and when I didn't have enough I went to the staff lounge and uh, that rounded it off nicely yeah no um, actually we did we there were several free lists available online for like bulletin board systems for people that needed to be able to monitor these things so we started with some freely available lists and then it was a very strange day honestly I had to sit down and read through these things and well, I, I didn't even know that was a word and and try to shrink this down to something manageable when we first started off we probably had about 200 or so words in there and, and I think it was too many because we got a lot of false positives so later on I went back through and I really trimmed it up to that list you see now it's about 112 words so anything in that list it's bad I mean it's just bad I don't know how they would be using these words any other way and if so I, I, I don't realize it and so you know feel free to use that list and again yeah it is just copy and paste it right in and then boof, that'll do it so if we go back over to here if I had wanted to not do twilight for the example of our bad word if I went back into testing here and I scroll down to objectionable content and I go back into edit and I go to edit the word list if I go to add another word I could just paste that in there hit OK and boom, it'll fill them all in is it possible to set up more than one list and have conditions based on what the word is so that you would get an alert say if suicide is spotted in an email as opposed to just oh oh yeah 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 good question um, so if you come here to if you hover your mouse above objectionable content notice that you get these pop-ups I was just hitting edit to go back in and edit the same one I had done but you see there's add another so yes you can have multiple lists and what I would say is like for example a good example would be like a concern word list so you've got an objectionable word list with 112 really dirty words just block those okay but then you do a concern word list um, yeah you could use the words like suicide or or what I mean, I'm not sure what you might choose but yes yeah, something that well there's no you know we're not intending to block these messages but we would like you know a red flag to go up just somebody to be aware you know hey this has been included in an email so go ahead and deliver it but append it to somebody send it to somebody else Eric so if if I'm searching for a phrase or word like hiring a new tech guy let's say I'm concerned about you know finding that, that would be that would be a good example <laughs> let's, let's say that and I'm, you know of course wearing my tinfoil hat why, why I put this in 
are is the uh, recipient notified that hey, you no. know, I'm creeping on their email or <laughs> No, no, good good question. You know, so important question. So let's right let's go back and we'll add another. And so we'll say for this one, we're going to say that we want to add um, you know, some other what's another word? Well, you said suicide. Okay. So we'll use uh, suicide. Oops. And we'll save that. Okay. What you could say in a case like that is, all right, uh, we're not going to reject the message. We're not choosing that. We're going to choose modify the message. And all that we're going to do is say that we want to add more recipients. So um, we're not going to change the subject. That, that's what would give, and, and, you know, and that's an option. In some cases, you want people to know, like, you may say, okay, if the bad word list, we're going to let it be delivered, but we're going to prepend it with something that says, you know, copy to administrator or something. You know, I mean, you could. I mean, you could do that. Uh, but in a case like this, no, you would just say add more recipients. And so you'd come in here and you'd say, you know, we need to add, you know, somebody else to that list and maybe use a catch-all account or a guidance counselor or something like that. And then they would get a copy of that email. Okay? Yes? So then when you do that, does the user know that it was... Um, no. Uh, okay, good question. Uh, pick your battles because when it comes to bad words, they will find other variations. Okay, um, how effective is a bad word list? Well, I mean, it's a good thing to have because you can say, listen, these are our expectations. We believe you should not be using these things. Email is used for educational purposes, but you are never going, ever going to be able to block all the things that they want to do. You know, if they can't, if they send something with a swear word and it gets rejected, they're going to spell it differently. They're going to put in something else in there. You will drive yourself crazy. Now, this is my opinion, but I don't think it's worth that fight. I've seen folks who, and I'll show you some tricks later uh, related to other things. I've seen people use these other tricks to try to put in every possible permutation and, I, and eventually, you, you know, they're going to find a way through, you know. So, yes, you can do something that involves wild cards, so to speak, but, you know, you're going to end up getting false positives and they're going to find another way to spell the word, you know. So, uh, but it's good to have that in there anyway. Okay, so that's a little bit about uh, two settings so far we've talked about. We've talked about keeping students from auto-forwarding their email to another address. We've disabled automatic forwarding. And we talked about bad word lists. Now, what happens if I try to send something with the word twilight in there? This should work now. So let me go ahead and I'll become this student real quick. And I'll compose a message and I'll send it to the other student. And I will say test and I will say twilight is such an awesome movie. Oh, I spelled it wrong, but that's that's authentic. That's how kids would spell. Now, let, let's see let's see if this works. Here we go. Sorry, a policy in place prevents this message from being sent. Now, I did not edit the canned response, but if I had, my canned response would have shown up there. Now, what you'll notice is interesting. Do you see how fast that was? This is different than Postini. If you're used to how Postini did it, the message was sent, Postini intercepted it, it got processed, and then it was decided would it be delivered, rejected, whatever. Because this is integrated into Google Apps now, it's actually at the Gmail level. When they go to send email, the rules have been pushed down to the actual Gmail screen there, and it immediately goes into place, and it stops them right away. So. Um, yeah. Did we find that it's still processing all the messages? Did we find that it's still processing the messages? Does it process all the rules? Oh, yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, a different thing between Postini and this, again, if you've used Postini in the past. Postini, if you had multiple rules, it went in order down the rules. And if it got to a rule that caused something to no longer function, you know, saying reject this message, that was it, it was done. It had no need to process the rest of the rules. That's not the case here. It does process every rule, okay? So it, there's not an order. Do this first, then this second, then this third. It processes all of them. So that is a little bit of a difference. But that's what it looks like. All right, let's pop back over. 
and see what else we might want to do. Another big one is blocking to other domains. Okay, a lot of people say, okay, we want our kids to have email. We don't want them to be able to automatically forward. Great. We don't want them to use bad words. Great. We want to watch out for concern words. Fantastic. We've got that. But we don't want them to send stuff outside of our domain, or we only want them to send them to certain domains. All right, no problem at all. To get into that, what we're going to do is go to this section called Restrict Delivery. And it's uh, really close to where we just were. There's the objectionable content we were just at. Right below there, you see Restrict Delivery. If I go in and click on Configure next to Restrict Delivery, it allows me to go ahead and add addresses or domains that we want to allow. So basically, by turning this on, you're saying this is the approved list of where students can send email and receive from. So if I go ahead and click on this, it's going to allow me to create lists. Now there's a couple of steps here. So sometimes people get a little confused and I've seen folks click here and start typing in the domains right here. That's actually not what you're doing. You're creating a list that's going to hold the domains in it. So you could have multiple approved lists and apply them however you want. I've got one called test obviously. So I'll just do test2 for this list. And now that I have created test2, it'll show up. I can now edit my test to list, and there's where I can now go in and add my addresses or domains. So I've created a list called test two, and now I can say these are the approved domains that they can send things to. Um, you know, and so you could put in your own domain. You could say you're allowed to send within your own domain. So we're northcantonschools.org. Okay. Or maybe there's a reason why they need to be able to communicate, you know, with WVIZ because you do some Newsday thing with them. So add that domain in there. Or, you know, you want them to get, you know, emails from Google.com, you know, because Google sometimes sends things. It, it can be, you know, it's whatever would work for you. Or you've got a school district where you've got three domains. Um, we do. <laughs> uh, just because we've got old addresses that are still valid. We used to be viking.stark.k12.oh.us. And then we became northcanton.spark.org because Spark is our county consortium. And now we're northcantonschools.org. All three of those are valid, you know, and so we can include all of those in there. Or maybe you've got a different domain for your students than your staff. This is where you would put in the approved domains that you would allow email to be sent to and received from. Okay? So I could go ahead and put that in and say save. And then go ahead and I'll hit add setting. And now save that. Now if I try to send to something outside of the domain, see what we get here, I'll send it to my personal email. And I don't know if this is an instantaneous one. Yep, it is too. Some, I, there, I know there are some that do take some time to process, but again, trying to send outside of the domain, it's not going to go. And of course, I could have, again, edited that custom rejection message for them. Okay? Any questions about, about that? About, yes, go ahead. Excellent question. Okay, so the question is, when they do violate this, does it get archived anywhere? Not to my knowledge. No, I'm not aware of any tracking. John, are you aware of any tracking? If so, I could just be wrong and just don't know that. I, I'm not aware of them being tracked anywhere. Could you put two rules in that says send a copy of that email and reject it? It would be worth a shot. Um, I don't know. I've never tried that. Very good question. Could you have multiple rules in? One that says, you know, block it. Another says that send it to this catch-all account. I'd have to try that. I don't know if that would work or if the fact that it's getting rejected right there would stop it in its tracks. But it would be worth trying out. It's a good one to investigate. All right. All right. Um, now, so far, so good. We're heading into the deep end of the pool now, though. Okay? Everything you've done so far, I think anybody can feel pretty comfortable with. Okay? Go in and add in the approved domains, put in the objectionable words, put in the concern words, stop automatic forwarding. Um, 
where things get a little bit more sophisticated is when you now need to say, okay, we've got mailing lists like we do, okay? We've got lists for our staff. Um, I don't want the students spamming the staff mailing lists, okay? We've got a mailing list for middle school teachers and one for high school math and one for first grade teachers. We've got student listservs, okay? I don't want the kids spamming the student listservs. That's for our teachers to use. Our students, we have listservs for each grade level. We have listservs for each building for the students. We have parent listservs. We collect our parent email addresses and we create Google groups, including those email addresses for the parents. So we've got parent listservs for each grade level and for each subject or for each teacher and for each building. Well, we want to stop the kids from being able to send email to those. There's no box in here to check just to make that happen, okay? So that's an example of a challenge, and we're going to talk about that. Another would be keeping students from being able to send to different, you know, grade levels. There's no box in here that says, don't let this org send to that org. Now, that would be nice, and maybe someday they'll add that, but it's not there. You can't just say, here's a rule, don't send to these orgs. It doesn't exist, okay? So here's what... You need to, and this is, I'm warning you, this is the deep end of the pool, okay? Um, what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about compliance filters, content compliance. So we're still in the same area, okay, where we've talked about objectionable content. We've talked about restricting delivery. Now we're going to get into something called content compliance. Um, and there's, there's so many things. I mean, we could talk about attachment compliance, which is good too. I mean, we're probably not going to have time to get into it, but you can say, no files that end in a dot NES for a Nintendo, you know, file or something like that, or no files that end in whatever. You can put in extensions that you want to block so they can't send attachments with certain extensions. You can append footers so that every message has a certain footer on the bottom with a disclaimer. All of that can be done there. But let's talk about content compliance. If I go into hit configure for content compliance, um, what you get into is rules now. These are a little bit more sophisticated, okay? So I can go and I can say, okay, inbound, outbound, however I want it to be. Um, and then I can say, I, I'm going to look for any message that matches a certain expression. And I can go in and I can add expressions. Now, it can be a simple thing like if this word shows up anywhere. Or it can be an advanced content match, and a lot of times it needs to be, okay? A lot of times you've got to build an advanced match to be able to fit your unique situation because every school is different. Now, how does this work? Basically, it allows you to say where to look. The headers in the body, the full headers, the body, the subject, the sender header, the recipient's header, the envelope sender, the raw message. You can pick whatever part, and I explain what those are in the handout. And then you can say... And what type of a match? So you could say, okay, anything where the, um, the envelope recipient who I'm sending this to starts with, ends with, contains text, doesn't contain text, equals, is empty, or matches or does not match a regex. Now, this is the real deep end of the pool here, okay? Anybody familiar with regular expressions? Does that mean anything to anybody? Okay, I feel bad for you, too, because I know. I've been there. Regular expressions are a way of programming to create a pattern matching that use very specific rules. And it's powerful stuff, and it's good stuff. And we're going to take a quick look at it here. Do not feel you're going to leave as an expert in regular expressions. I've been using them for many, many, many years, and I am not an expert in regular expressions. But they allow you to say, Say if the envelope recipient who I'm sending it to matches a certain pattern, then go ahead and do something. Now you're cooking with gas. Okay, now we've got the real power here. To show you this, I'm going to pop back over to our presentation because I've already kind of worked this out for you here. We've already talked about all of this stuff, so let's get past there. All right, here we go. So regular expressions. In the handout and in the presentation, I've got links to these. So there's guidelines out there to help you understand how regular expressions work. But I'm going to show you an example real quick. And this example would be, let's say that you want to block email to a certain um, grade level. So in this case, I'm going to say that 
the students are only allowed to send email um, to people that are in the 2020 graduating class. We'll just use that as our example here. So I don't know what grade that makes them, but I guess we could do math and go backwards there. Okay, fifth graders, very <laughs> good, okay, thank you. So what I would do inside of that content compliance section is I would go in and I would say internal sending because I'm only sending to students within our domain because that's where they're at. And I would say for the conditions, I want the envelope recipients like we were just looking at, who's receiving the email to not match this regex. So what I'm saying is this regex is an acceptable address they can send to, okay? If it doesn't match, if it doesn't match that, reject the message. Okay, so we're going to break this down in just a second so you can see what on earth that craziness is, okay? But what we're saying is if the person I'm sending it to doesn't match this, reject it. They're not in your grade level, okay? They don't fit in that grade level there, okay? So in this case, let's break this down a little bit. Basically what it's saying is, and these are the different parts of the regex, and again, don't expect that you have to be an expert on any of that kind of stuff. There's all those tutorials out there that can help. But basically, the first part said ignore case. Okay, question mark I there says don't worry about upper or lower case. And then the slash W means the beginning of a word. So from the beginning of the word. And then I put in my group options here. And I say something like, okay, um, if it has 2020 at the start, followed by the letters A to Z, any kind of letters, from one to 25 letters, that's as many as you can do, followed by whatever your domain is, that is matching the address of a 2020 graduating class student. Or if it matches a staff email address, because we're letting them send it to there, so the pipe means or. Or if we want to uh, have it be any alphanumeric character from one to 25, because that's how we name our staff members at our domain, if it's either one of those, then good. That is an acceptable type of, a, of an address. You can send it to 2020 smithj at northcantonschools.org, or you can send it to smithj at northcantonschools.org. Anything that doesn't fit that, though, ends up getting rejected because, as we showed, we choose reject message for anything that doesn't match the regex. So you can get really crazy sophisticated here and start setting up some really um, very powerful rules. And that's what we use for things like blocking to our listservs. Uh, so for example, I'll show you what that one looks like. I'll just bring it up here on the screen. I don't know if you'll be able to see it real well there, but we'll bring it up. So like if I go into students and I come down, oh, I logged out. All right. So, if we go back to students and we go down to content compliance, and we see, uh, which one do I want here? Block to listservs, okay? So, if I go in and take a look at our listserv one, basically I'm saying that if the students try to send an email message that matches, and it may be really hard to see from back there. I wonder if I can zoom in here. Let me try. Yeah. Okay. If it matches list or stew or pair, because we start all of our, our listservs off with list dash something is a staff listserv, stew dash something is a student listserv, pair dash something is a parent listserv. Okay. So if it's stew, if it's list, stew, or, or pair, followed by a dash, followed by letters or numbers up to 25 characters, and followed by either North Canton Schools or North Canton Spark or Viking.Stark, if it fits any of that, that's a listserv. That's one of our mailing lists. And if that's the case, reject the message. So if it matches those, we do not want the students to be able to send to it, and so that bounces them out from being able to send to our listservs. Okay? So that's an example of how that could be done. Now, we're about out of time, but I do want to explain that there is hope for you if you have not named your students in such a way that you can identify them by 
their graduation year, okay? In the handout, I go into a lot more detail about it, but I'll just tell you the general concept behind it. If you've got them named in such a way that there's no easy way to distinguish them, what you can do, guys, is you can come in here to one of your orgs. So I'll go into like sub one. We'll pretend that's like our first graders or something. And what I can do is I can use a trick where I can go in and I can append a footer. And what I can do is I can add, well, I already did one here, so you can see it. I can add sent from NCCS grade one account, okay? And I put little asterisks in front and behind it. You can put in a little custom footer on the message. If you stamp that on every single message that goes out from the grade one org, what can you do on the other end then? You can create a content compliance filter that looks for that and rejects it if it's coming from a grade that's not appropriate. So on the other end, then I could go into the high school ones and say, if the body of the message contains this unique string of text, reject it because that's from a grade level you're not supposed to be communicating with. And, you know, you gotta pick something unique because otherwise you don't want false positives. So throw in some fancy little characters there to make it a little unique. But that would be a way to work around the system until eventually maybe they add some options in there for us to block based on organization. Okay? Yes? And in that example you just described, does the first grader, does the descending fail? Or does the receiving Excellent question. Where does it fail? In this case, it's the receiving that fails. Because there's going to be nothing in here that's going to stop me from being able to send it out because I don't have anything to match on. They can send it to another student, and the students all have kind of randomish IDs. I can't match the recipient as it's going out. But the message gets to the Gmail of the receiving student, and the content compliance filter stops it there, bounces it back. And so, they, so it, that one, there is going to be a delay before it gets back to them. And, and then it comes back to the sender with, uh, and again, you can make that, reply, say anything you want. It could just simply be, you know, you have sent to email to a grade level different than your own or whatever the case might be, okay? So I know that's a lot in a really short amount of time. So let me just say a couple of quick things as we start to wrap up. Again, please, on the Apps User Group website, you'll find all this information. The shortcut link on the handout will take you straight here. Otherwise, if you go to presentations, these are all the different presentations I give. And one of them is right here, Google Apps Email Security. That's the one we're talking about right now. All of the handouts are here. And I would definitely encourage you to look at the, not the bad word list. Well, unless you need to. That's fine. You, know, you can. Look, and not that one either. Or that one. Ah, the handout. The handout goes into gory details on everything we've talked about here today, especially when it gets into the regex stuff. Please do not feel overwhelmed by that. The first time you look at it, it is really crazy stuff, but I go into all the details of that in here and have a lot of helpful links if you need to go into that. Also, feel free to contact me. I can't guarantee that I can you know, email you right back, but I will definitely be glad to take any questions you have and you know, try to give you some assistance. Or if you have a, a regex that you're having trouble with, I'll be more than happy to read through it and try to see where you might have gone astray with a parenthesis or something odd in there. But uh, if you have any other questions, I will definitely hang around. But I know we've just hit the 845 mark, so that is the time we're supposed to stop. So definitely come. Uh, I'll be doing two more tomorrow, one on BYOD and one on Picasso Web Albums. And Wednesday, I'm doing the live State of Tech with Eric and Sean. So hope that you guys have a fantastic time here. Thanks for coming at 8 in the morning on the first day. You guys rock. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great conference. Thanks,